Well, good morning, Dublin West Community Church. I hope you're all doing well. Nice to uh, be with you, even if I can't see you, as we uh, do this video thing again. Going to continue uh, this morning with our Lenten readings, um, which have been in Luke's Gospel, um, following Jesus uh, in his journey through Luke. And we're at Luke chapter 18. Uh, it's before Palm Sunday. Luke 18 is the end of his journey to Jerusalem. And we're looking at that middle chunk there. There's three stories. Um, and while we haven't um, picked these readings for these strange days of shutdown of the coronavirus, um, I want to I wanna read them from that lens, from that perspective. And so my question for these three stories, these, these pictures of faith, is what does faith look like in this strange day? What does faith look like in this strange day? I'm going to centre on the middle story of the three, um, which is the one where the little children come to Jesus. Um, the story uh, begins with people bringing their babies to Jesus. Uh, maybe they're seeking him to, to bless them, to hold them and pray a blessing for them. But the disciples are just not happy. They rebuke them, they give out to them, and they sort of try and shoo them away. But Jesus says no. Jesus is like, let the children come to me. And so they come to him. Uh, and then Jesus speaks afterwards. And what we're presented with in this story is children as the picture of faith. That's the, the picture of faith for us today. Children. Jesus says at the end, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter. Children are the picture of faith. Why? What is it about children that make them so good in terms of faith, such a model for us in terms of faith? And different people have guessed different things from what they know from their own experience of children. They're maybe very trusting, uh, which would link to, to faith in the kingdom. Maybe it's the openness of children and the receptivity of children, something like that. Uh, I, I wonder what you think it is that make children the model of faith. Um, and perhaps you're getting to spend a lot more time with your children now. Maybe this could be your quarantine challenge. In these days, your quarantine challenge, as you spend so much time with your children uh, and possibly with no one else, discover this, watch them, learn from them. This model of faith that run around your house and ransack it. What is it about them and faith? I think Luke does give us one or two clues in the passage um, as to his take on this. Um, and the first is that he does use the phrase babies at the start. The rest of the passage becomes children. And for, for Matthew and Mark, when they have this story, they, they say children. But Luke turns it to babies first at the start. Puts a different dimension on it to, to, to newborns, to the smallest of children. And what can they do? Newborns, nothing, absolutely nothing. They're completely helpless. They're wholly dependent on someone else to look after them, to do everything for them, to feed them, to change them, to, to, to lift them up and cuddle them, show affection to them, to speak to them and give them attention. Someone else initiates that and does that. They are helpless. They're wholly dependent. And maybe that is what Jesus is getting at here. And the other little clue from Luke, um, which isn't in my version, which is the NIV, he says people were also bringing babies. Um, it actually says in, in the Greek, it has that even babies, even babies, pointing to the fact that they're, they're the last people that you'd expect to be brought to Jesus, are babies, newborns, because of their unimportance, because they're, they're, they're not seen as, as worthy or important. They're really just very, very vulnerable. These very uh, smallest of children. And that fits in with Luke. Luke's gospel is the gospel of the poor. Um, his version of the life of Jesus is the, the one that emphasizes social justice. That's the theme that he takes. And in the first century context in which Jesus ministered, in which Luke was writing, these newborns, the small and the powerless, because of those qualities, they would have been overlooked at times. They would have been dispossessed at times. When a baby uh, was born in, in, in the family, it was 
if it was a boy, that would have been uh, that would have been celebrated because they would have been an asset for the future family business. Um, and they would have ensured that the family would have continued for another generation. They would have kept on the family name. But they were the things that were, were part of that culture. It wasn't just for this joy of, of new life. Um, and there were awful practices in the ancient world of infanticide, of abandoning children. They were vulnerable. Even babies. Vulnerable and worthless. And I think that vulnerability links in to the helplessness above. So I, I don't know what you're feeling today, um, what you've been feeling this week and the crisis as you continue to be shut in to your own uh, house, barely getting out, having limited contact, uh, maybe watching the news and seeing some horror stories from around the world and the numbers and the curves just heading upwards and feeling helpless. It's okay to feel helpless. You are, we are helpless um, largely in the face of this crisis. And that's okay. That's okay from a faith side. Helplessness, like the helplessness of a newborn child, is a picture of faith. And the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Because in our helplessness, we turn to God. That is when we express our dependence on him. It makes me think of, of one of my favourite episodes from The Simpsons. Um, actually, Dermot, if you're listening this morning, we were talking about this. You were reminding me of this episode just a few weeks ago when we did get to, to have church in person and over tea and coffee. Um, we were talking about that episode where Homer and Marge, if you don't know The Simpsons, it's that sort of adult cartoon, and Homer and Marge are the mum and dad. And in this episode, their marriage is in trouble. Um, Homer has to, to, to go back into some education and he ends up teaching a class on secrets to a successful marriage in which he then, to, to, to become popular and, and keep people in the classroom, he ends up telling them all the secrets from his own marriage and everyone in the town knows all these things about marriage, like she dyes her hair and various things. And so she gets very upset and marriage is in trouble. Homer's kicked out of the house. He's living in a tree house um, outside, which... I guess maybe it's just physical distancing, I don't know. Um, but in this trouble, Homer goes to Lisa, who's the daughter, and, and, and um, eight, ten years old, I don't know. And but she's the smart kid. And Homer's like, Lisa, how can I trick mum uh, to take me back? And Lisa's like, you can't trick someone into loving you. But if you want to get mum back, you just have to remember what you give her that no one else can give her. So Homer's left with that question. What can he give her that no one else can give her? And Homer struggles with this question and eventually he comes back into the house with a bunch of flowers. But he finds another man there, one of his friends from, who runs the bar, trying to come in and, and, and nick Marge away with a bunch of flowers while, while he's in the treehouse. Um, so he has to throw away the flowers. That's not going to work. But then it dawns on him. And he has this romantic moment when he realises and he says to her, I know what I can offer you that no one else can. Complete and utter dependence. And Mars like Homer, that is not a good thing. And it is not a good thing, not valued in our world, and not healthy for human to human relationships. But with God, helplessness, dependence, that's a picture of faith. Like newborn children. That is um, a good thing, not just even okay, but good. And you see, that links into the previous story of this, this reading, which is the Pharisee and the tax collector. You remember the Pharisee goes in and he prays to God. And he's praying, thank you that I'm not like these other people, these, these, these wasters and these sinners. But the tax collector comes in and he just says, help. Help. The words of his prayer are, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. He just says help. Helplessness is okay. I wonder if you just have those moments of saying help. Help me, Father. In these last few weeks. The last picture of faith in our reading is the rich young ruler. Uh, who has this encounter with Jesus. 
Um, you might remember the story, and uh, maybe you've been reading it already this morning. Um, and so he goes up to Jesus. He's looking for eternal life. Um, and, and Jesus says, you, you know, the commands, and they list the commands. And it comes down to money for him. Jesus tells him, you have to sell all that you have, give it away to the poor, and then you can come follow me. And this young man cannot respond. Turns out that he's just too devoted to money. It has this hold on him, on his heart, and he can't respond. And he ends up missing out on this new life with Jesus because of that. But this is all a revelation to him. And that's the interesting bit that I want to pick up uh, today. It was a revelation to him. He did not know that until this encounter with Jesus. This encounter revealed his heart to him. It revealed his, his true person, what he loved, who he was, what he valued. And who he really was on the inside, his character, came out in this encounter. It was new to him. When Jesus asked him the question, you know, the commands, he, he lists them off and says he, he's obeyed them. He lists off the commands, but it's the neighbor-focused commands. Of the Ten Commandments, the numbers five to ten are the ones focused on love your neighbor. One to four on love the Lord your God. And he lists the neighbor focused commands. It was new to him that, that this love of money had stopped him from obeying the first four commands. And when Jesus says to him and challenges him to, to give up his money, that shocks him. He is shocked. It's a revelation to him. It says he became sad. So this, this revelation is, is, is new and important to him. And I wonder this morning, uh, uh, in the strange times that we live in, what will this crisis reveal to us? What will this crisis reveal in us, for all of us? See, in some way, this is part of what the media is asking already. Uh, if you're like me, you're sort of inundated reading articles and watching TV about all that's going on. And, and a, a segment of that conversation is commenting on how it might change us as a society and as a culture. What will be different? We've, we've brought in the, the private hospitals now into the, into the system. We've sort of nationalized um, our, our healthcare system. And this conversation is, could it be like this? Could it stay like this? We've shown our respect for the workers on the front line in health, our doctors and nurses, by going out at, at 8 p.m. on Thursday night and clapping for them on the street. And um, we've shown community spirit in lots of ways. We've, we've come together as a nation um, by staying apart. And so how is this going to change us? Well, I want to ask the faith side of that question. How will this crisis change us? What will it reveal in us, inside us, in our heart, in our faith? For that young ruler, it revealed wealth to him as a barrier, this undue devotion he had to wealth. See, in the crisis, we're going to have things taken away from us. We're knocked out of our normal pattern of life and living. We have to spend a lot more time with some people and, and no time with other people. It's all new and different. And that's going to reveal stuff in us. Be on the lookout for that. Reflect on that. And even more than that, can I, can I ask and encourage you to pray that? To pray boldly to God to reveal stuff in you at this time to do his work in you at this time. Now, it might be difficult, and truth can be hard. This young man was reduced to silence before Jesus. He became sad. But we can face this truth without fear, because we know that whatever it is, God will help us respond. His love for us will remain in grace, um, and he will help us respond. What is impossible of man is possible of God. So as stuff is revealed to us about who we are in this crisis, we can change with God's help and, and move and find that this can be a place of growth for us. So this morning, I just want to leave you with really those two thoughts from these stories. That helplessness is okay, and if you're feeling helpless this morning or this week, that's okay. Just bring that to God. And secondly, to, to pray that brave prayer as to what can this crisis reveal within us, within the depths of our being. Thank you. Good morning.